I'm gonna level with you that regardless of what the subject of this video might have you think, I'm not really much of a gamer. I mean, sure, I had my glory days with Pokemon, just as any half-decent 90s kid. But gradually I felt like more and more, my friends were moving to online gaming experiences such as FIFA or Call of Duty. And those were never really my thing. I've always been more of an offline campaign player, with games such as Uncharted, or The Last of Us, or The Witcher 3 being my most memorable experiences after childhood. And if you've played any of these games, you'll probably agree they have really awesome and really cinematic narratives, which was a prerequisite to draw me in. Let's jump forward then to the end of 2021, when I first heard about Elden Ring. And to be honest, what caught my interest was the involvement of George R. R. Martin, writer of the A Song of Ice and Fire books slash Game of Thrones series, and also Miyazaki, the mastermind behind Studio Ghibli. And yeah, I've since learned those are actually two very different Miyazakis, but that's just how ignorant I was about from software back then. And if that's your case too, dear viewer, don't worry, this video doesn't require any prior knowledge. Pinky promise. Anyway, considering Game of Thrones is, hands down, my favorite piece of storytelling ever, I started playing the game the day it came out, and the results were, well, not particularly glorious. Ignorant of basically everything, I chose the runes as my starting item, accidentally used them at once since I was not familiar with the commands, talked to White Mask Var and thought he was pretty much a jerk, and that's when I saw a rider in the distance. A literal golden knight in shining armor. That looks like a friend, I thought. So I went to talk with that friendly neighborhood tree sentinel, and of course I immediately died and lost those runes. Tens of hours of gameplay later, my situation was no longer as desperate, but still, I was rather disappointed. I was like, what the hell did George contribute to this game? There's no story. Just a beautiful world where everyone's an asshole who's out to get you. Which, again, just goes to show how little I knew. Given the content of this video and everything I've said so far, it probably won't surprise you to learn that I've since altered my opinion, and the pivotal moment in this change was the discovery of an extremely dedicated online community that aims to piece together this game's history through the analysis of item descriptions, dialogues, and environmental storytelling. Honestly, this may sound a bit dramatic, but it was like a mind-blowing experience for me that you could engage with a story in this way. As I've said, all of my recent gaming experiences had been easily understandable, highly cinematic narratives, so the idea that you could engage with a story like this, first wandering around, absolutely lost, getting acquainted with the locations, the enemies, the bosses, experiencing that incredible atmosphere, beautiful yet broken, surreal and morbid, and then go and engage with an online community to learn of all of the possible theories as to what's actually going on? Well, suffice it to say I have since finished Elden Ring, Bloodborne and Dark Souls 1, and I'm currently in varying stages of Demon's Souls and Dark Souls 2 and 3. So maybe I have become a bit of a gamer after all. Or just a FromSoft simp. More specifically, a Miyazaki simp. Yeah, both Miyazakis, but let's focus on the gaming one. Cause this cryptic style of storytelling, it has his fingerprints on it. You can find several interviews online where he speaks of his experience as a kid of reading books in English he couldn't really understand which forced him to fill in the gaps with illustrations and his imagination. And he explicitly says he attempts to emulate part of this experience with his games. That's pretty awesome, right? Which makes me kind of sad that so many people thought it absurd when Elden Ring was nominated in the Game Awards for Best Narrative, which it lost to God of War Ragnarok, though it won the Game of the Year award itself. Now, you might have noticed that everything I've said in this video so far has been a digression, 
but that changes here. Since a lot of people complained about Elden Ring getting this nomination without even having a proper narrative, and since we just got the announcement of the game's first DLC, I thought I'd make a video summing up the story of the character indicated as the most popular in all the polls I managed to find. Granny the Witch. And if you're one of the viewers who've never played the game, I'll make this as accessible as I can. This will lead to some simplifications as well as to me stating as facts what are actually just one of several competing theories. So if you're instead a hardcore player, try not to get too mad in the comments. If you're looking for a pure lore hunting video, I'll link a particularly deep one on Rennie in the description. One warning, this section will be the densest of this video for those who haven't played the game, since I'll just info dump the whole context. But bear with me, and it will get easier. In very, and I mean very basic terms, the game takes place in the lands between, a world ruled by a deity known as the Greater Will, which values order above all else. The Greater Will is not directly present in the lands between, rather, it has an individual act as host for the Elden Ring, which is sort of a programming code for reality. For instance, although there were past iterations of the Elden Ring, the individual currently chosen as its vessel is Queen Merica, who removed the Rune of Death from it. And the consequence of removing the concept of death from the world's programming code is that no one can truly die, that being the in-game explanation as to why the playable character is reborn after each death. Marika then gave this rune of death for safekeeping to Malikath, her shadow, which, for the purposes of this video, will define as a bodyguard assigned to her by the Greater Will. Anyway, Marika herself is secretly two beings in one, with Radagon being her other half, and Radagon married Renala, ending a war between her family and Queen Marika, which leads us to this web of relationships thus far. Eventually, Marika exiles her first consort, summons Radagon, and marries him, which brings the concept of marrying your other half to a whole new level. But this leaves Renala mentally crippled, literally making clones of herself with the objective of creating one Radagon finds worthy of remarrying. And by the way, the observant player might have noticed that when we fight her, her second and far more powerful stage is not really her, but a projection put in place by Rani herself in order to protect her now feeble mother. This is never made explicit, as is proper in FromSoft's cryptic style of storytelling, but it is what many have deduced from Rani's voiceover before the second stage begins, and from the fact that Renala is not dead after we beat her. But as we were saying, way before the player meets Renala, Radagon abandoned her to marry his other half Marika, leaving her a shadow of her former self. And as we can deduce from that projection spell, Rani is rather protective of her mother, which means this might very well have marked the beginning of her feelings of animosity towards Radagon and the greater will he so fiercely defended. Regardless of this animosity, the greater will's oracles in the lands between, the two fingers, chose Rani as an Empyrean aka a potential candidate to succeed Merica as the vessel for the Elden Ring. As such, the Greater Will assigned Rani her own shadow bodyguard, Blight, this big doggle who became like a brother to her. The thing is, it seems being an Empyrean grants the Greater Will some sort of control over you, which was not something Rani appreciated. It's not clear exactly how this control works, but we know from an item description belonging to Iji, one of her other followers, that he was terrified of the possibility of the Greater Will influencing his thoughts to cause him to betray her, which is why he wears this Magneto-style helm. And I mean, the name Greater Will itself might suggest some kind of mental oversight. Rennie, as you might have already guessed, started plotting a way to free herself from this hold. And let me tell you, she came up with a rather creepy solution. Remember Queen Merica the Eternal, and how she had taken the Rune of Death from the Elden Ring and given it to her shadow, Malekith the Black Blade, for safekeeping? 
Malekith, this imposing bodyguard, then became the only being in the realm able to deal out death, which obviously made him feared. Rani, though, managed to steal a fragment of the Rune of Death from him, which is no small feat. But she then used this fragment to create weapons capable of killing a demigod. The Black Knives, wielded by the Black Knife Assassins. Which leads us to the Night of Black Knives, when these assassins killed Godwin the Golden, a child of Queen Merica with Godfrey, her previous consort before she exiled him and married Radagon. This death led Marika to break the Elden Ring, an event known as the Shattering, plunging the lands between into a period of chaos and civil war. Which is where the game actually starts, with our final objective being to repair the Elden Ring with any of the six configurations we can choose from, some of which are not according to the Greater Wheel's designs. But what about Rani? Why did she assist in Godwin's death? Well, that's where it gets interesting. Godwin actually died only in soul, but not in flesh, which is arguably a fate worse than death, since his flesh then became this monstrosity that is now making its corruption known through the lands between. But correspondingly, Rani Chu died only half a death, only in flesh, but not in soul. This ritual allowed her to transfer her soul to a doll body, which left her weakened, but free from the greater will's hold on her Empyrean flesh. And it's interesting to note that even though her physical form was red-haired like her father, and even though she certainly could have transferred herself to a doll in her original likeness, she instead chose one who resembled her secret mentor, the Snow Witch, a figure about which we know very little. This choice, of course, only further shows her dislike for the greater will and for her father, Radagon, who was so devoted to it. So, that was a lot, right? But regardless of how much it might have been, it's all lore, by which I mean it refers to events that took place before the game began, as opposed to those that occurred during the player's journey. So, are those who say Elden Ring has no proper story correct, then? Well, I find it hard to believe lore is something different than story rather than a subcategory of it, but either way, those who seek to complete Rani's questline and implement her The Age of Stars ending will find there's a lot of story pertaining to her. For instance, another of her followers, the sorcerer Preceptor Seluvis, who specializes in building and controlling puppets, and who is possibly the one who built Rani's body, actually plans to betray Rani, and the player has the choice to help him develop a potion that would turn her doll body into a puppet under his control. Regardless of whether the player helps him, the plan fails and he is killed, most likely by Rani or Blight at her command. But once more, we see her plotline revolving around her determination to preserve her free will. She sacrificed her flesh to stop being a puppet to the greater will, so she was not about to play that same role to Seluvis. Though there are theories that Seluvis himself was another character's puppet. But that's beyond the scope of this video. Back to the subject of free will. Another relevant plot point in Rani's story has to do with us defeating her brother, General Radan, this nice fellow here. You might think it a bit ridiculous that a giant like him is riding such a punny horse, but the game fully leans into it explaining that as he kept growing, he went to the trouble of dedicating himself to mastering gravity magic so that he could keep riding his favorite steed, which is named Leonard, even after he could no longer support his natural weight. I mean, that's actually pretty adorable, right? The thing is, after he became such a prodigy in gravity magic, Radan took it upon himself to hold all the stars in place. There's some debate as to why he did that, on whether it was just a vanity project, but my favorite explanation is that Queen Merica's reign, with the removal of death from the Elden Ring, was all about the indefinite preservation of the world as it was. She did get the moniker Merica the Eternal, after all. With that in mind, the act of paralyzing the stars is tantamount to paralyzing fate, and thus change itself, since destiny is said to be represented by the stars in the universe. Or maybe he was just a Scorpio or something. I don't know. 
Astrology is not really my thing. Anyway, Rani needed Radan to go, and if the player chooses to defeat this optional boss, there will be a cutscene showing the stars getting back in motion, and at once, one of them crashes into the lands between, opening a passage to a civilization which the Greater Wheel had exiled underground, namely, the Nox, whose beliefs and magic were also intrinsically linked to the stars, so much so that they went through the trouble of conjuring themselves a fake night sky, even though they lived beneath the earth. Several issues pertaining to free will surround the Nox, since they, through experiments that seem analogous to alchemy, are very likely the creators of a sentient race known as the Albinorix, which is persecuted in the lands between under the belief that, since they were created, they exist outside the grace of the greater will. Which, if you think about it, is pretty similar to the debates we see in sci-fi movies about whether to grant any rights to artificial intelligences, about whether to acknowledge them as true vessels for personhood. After all, free will and personhood are often linked concepts. The Albinorix were likely created as part of an effort by the Nox to make a being powerful enough to overthrow the greater will. But again, I digress. None of that has to do with Rani. What does is the fact that the Nox, in their quest to overthrow the greater will, created a weapon known as the Finger Slayer Blade, so named because it is able to kill the oracles of the greater will which, as you might remember, are the two fingers. The player, after exploring the Nox cities, has the option of delivering this weapon to Rani, and if this is done, she will then proceed to slay one of these oracles, perhaps the one that had once chosen her as an Empyrean, and which had had some hold over her flesh. Before that, though, something else happens, and unfortunately, it has to do with Best Doggo Blight. Remember how I said he was a shadow gifted to Rani by the Greater Will? I said he was a bodyguard, but that's not the whole truth. He's actually an assassin as well, meant to slay her should she turn against the designs of the Two Fingers. But the thing is, he himself didn't know about that. In his mind, and of his own free will, he was fully loyal to her. The keyword being, as you've probably guessed by now, free will. Being a shadow meant there was some sort of override mechanism that could be activated to put him in a possession-like state that would cause him to execute Rani when she tried to implement her plan. Rani, mastermind that she is, was very much aware of this, and as such, she had him in prison in a Nevergale, a sort of pocket dimension prison you can find several enemies trapped in throughout the game. Now. I couldn't find any confirmation as to whether his being there would keep him from being possessed when she made her move, but personally, I like to believe that's the case. It makes for a neat little contradiction. In order to keep his free will, aka his mental freedom, she took away his physical freedom. We do know she cared for him like family, so that theory sits best with me. Well, let me know what you think in the comments. The player can choose to free Blight, in which case he will next be found by Rani's door, possessed and aggressive, forcing you to slay him. But anyway, with Rani having slain the two fingers, the players may pledge themselves to her one final time, and after beating the final boss, they may summon her, choosing the Age of Stars ending. Now, what's this ending about? Honestly, that's a pretty hilarious story. Remember when we talked about how Miyazaki used to read books in English without a good understanding of the language, which forced him to fill in the gaps through illustrations and his imagination? Well, this game's original dialogue is in Japanese, and at many points, the translation is apparently pretty terrible. I mean, there's a whole niche of YouTubers who are fluent in both English and Japanese, dedicated to pointing out these differences. And boy. Do they have a field day when talking about Rani's ending? In the English version, she describes the Age of Stars as separating everyone's souls from their bodies until emotions become impossibilities. A rather creepy and invasive thing to do without everyone's consent. Which is honestly bizarre, since her whole questline revolves around the search for free will. But apparently, that has nothing to do with the original Japanese text, which supposedly states that she wishes to take herself and her new order far away 
so that everyone's life can develop without divine meddling or oversight. Which, you guessed it, is basically granting everyone their free will, which was constricted under the greater will's search for perfect order. Does this make her a purely heroic figure? Probably not. I mean, she orchestrated the death of both her brother Radan and her half-brother Godwin, and she also caused the shattering, a literal cataclysm that led to a whole era of civil war, devastation and suffering, but she also gave everyone back their freedom. So, no omelets without some broken eggs or something. Let me know your take in the comments. But I know, I know, I said there would be something hilarious in the way, and here it is. You're telling me there's this guy who spent his entire childhood struggling with translations from English to Japanese, then he rises to be a prominent figure in the gaming industry, but can't stop the most popular character in his most popular game from being grossly misunderstood everywhere outside his country due to translation issues? I mean, hell, tell me that doesn't deserve a laugh. That would be that for Ren's story then. Hopefully by now you've come to agree that even though everyone's entitled to dislike from software's style of storytelling, it's fundamentally unfair to say a game like Elden Ring lacks a story. I mean, Rick and Morty did pretty much the same plotline, right? Do all of you remember who you are? Yeah, uh, my name is Ron Benson. I'm an electrical engineer, father of two. And as you can see from my flat concentric nipple rings, I'm a member of this planet's top race. Okay, that's good. Uh, don't focus too much on the last part. Anyway, thanks for watching. This is still a rather new channel, and I'll cover not only uh, video games, but geek culture in general. So if you like that kind of stuff, it would be a great help if you could. Like, subscribe, comment, all that algorithm nonsense. Anyway, that's that for this one. I'm Pedro Perizoto from Geekzoto. Be a good geek, and I'll see you next time.